Thank you. Good good afternoon. Um, we, we're very pleased to be joining you today and um, very grateful to Chancellor Sorondo for inviting us to, um, to, such, a, to such an event. Okay. Thank you very much, Francesco, for the presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Gemma Pasquali. And with my sister Viola, we own Olioteca Villa Campestri and Villa Campestri Olive Oil Resort. So the, the objectives of our presentation today are twofold. The, the first one is to leverage scientific research and a case study of uh, Paolo Pasquali's Olioteca Villa Campestri to show how sensory science, emotion, technology, and design can be used to increase engagement around the olive oil experience, which is going to be a recurring theme in our presentation, that of experience. So this will accomplish a couple of objectives. Uh, the first one is to understand further uh, the drivers of consumer behavior, not just the sensory drivers, but uh, more broadly speaking, around olive oil. And the second one is to honor um, the memory and uphold the, the legacy of Paolo Pasquale. So what I'd like to start with is um, some sensory science principles as they apply to olive oil and extra virgin olive oil. And what I want to do is to talk about the flavors of olive oil, because there is huge diversity here. Then uh, to talk about the way olive oil is currently evaluated or sanctioned as extra virgin by uh, certified panels. And then make some, some points about what consumers like in terms of olive oil, and then what experts would, would state is high quality olive oil. So when we talk about sensory properties of olive oil, we often focus on two things. The first one is the, the fruity character of the oil, which can be labeled ripe fruity or green fruity. And then we sometimes touch on additional features coming from phenolic materials, which can be bitterness and pungency. And then we have to talk about defects, which are present in, in a number of olive oils. And those are things like rancidity, the result of oxidation, fusty from fermentation during the, the harvesting or post-harvesting process, uh, musty characters and whiny. But if you look at different types of uh, vocabularies that have been arranged for olive oil, like the one shown on this slide, you will see that you have really a, a huge diversity of sensory properties. So when we... Um, talk about olive oil, we, we like to focus our attention on extra virgin olive oil, which needs to meet a number of uh, characteristics into how it's, it's manufactured or processed. And in addition, a taste panel accredited by the International Olive Council must taste the oil and uh, show that it has some fruity character, either ripe or green fruit, with possibly some bitterness and some pungency and that it is free of defects. So there is um, a number of standards that have been developed by the IOC, and they manage all these panels all over the world and, and, and certify them every year. So this is the process by which the sensory piece of it, uh, by which an olive oil is going to be deemed extra virgin. So one of the issues that uh, we want to bring up today is whether that should be done uh, by sensory evaluation, or whether there is room for analytical chemistry to complement or even replace that process. So sensory evaluation, even by an official taste panel, is still regarded as subjective by many. And every time some big studies are done and, and make the point that maybe some extra virgin olive oils are not so extra virgin when it comes to sensory quality, that becomes very controversial. The second point I want to make is that extra virgin olive oil is the only food product that requires this kind of certification by a sensory panel. On the other hand, analytical flavor chemistry has made substantial progress in identifying and quantifying markers of olive oil sensory quality. Cost might be an obstacle in terms of the initial investment, but sensory panels are not cheap either. So our recommendations, and that's coming from sensory scientists, is that we should really push forward uh, to move the certification of extra virgin olive oil to analytical chemistry. 
The next thing I want to talk about is what do consumers like uh, when they uh, taste or uh, evaluate olive oil. And I'm going to talk about a set of techniques that we refer to as preference mapping. With preference mapping, we show um, a group of consumers a set of olive oils that are very diverse in terms of sensory quality. And then we ask them how they like the olive oils. We then apply multivariate statistics, like principal component analysis or cluster analysis. And then we see how many groups of consumers there are with different likes and dislikes. And regardless of the product that we study, we're always going to find that preference segmentation because we don't all like the same thing. If we do this with olive oil, uh, what the graph on the left shows you uh, for a, a range of olive oils that are shown in blue uh, from all over the world, um, each red arrow represents a consumer's main direction of liking. And what you can see is that there is some diversity, but they're, they're somewhat clustered in one direction. And if we overlap, the map that's on the right side, we can see which sensory attributes uh, would match uh, the preferences of, of most of these consumers. And what you can see, there is a long vector uh, rancid pointing down to the right, and that's pretty much the direction where there are quite a few consumers. So you might say, you might conclude that people like defective and rancid olive oils, which when we put out the results of this study was, was what was publicized. But I also want to point out that these consumers are found opposite uh, other vectors that show bitter and pungent so, and, and astringent. So what it means is that those consumers might be uh, somewhat satisfied with, with defective oils, but more uh, likely they are rejecting things that are too bitter or pungent. So we have some, some work to do there. So we summarize these different preference clusters on, on, this, uh, on this slide. And again, the biggest of the three preference segments we found tended to dislike bitter, pungent, and astringent oil. And they liked um, oils that were somewhat uh, defective. Because olfactory preferences are, are driven by exposure. So when you're exposed to that kind, kind of product, you learn to like the, these kinds of, uh, of, and expect those kinds of aromas. Well, we repeated the studies the, the same study 10 years later. Uh, we completed it right before the pandemic. And guess what happened? This repetita, we found the same results. So it's a bit frustrating because we thought the general public would move in their preferences. But this time, uh, what you see on the left are eight different oils. And again, the main direction of preferences for the consumers. And what you see is that most of them are, are bunched to the right of the graph. And to the left are three, uh, three oils, uh, which, are, which I will mention uh, further in a moment. But again, we found three different uh, preference segments. And again, the, um, the, the oils that, the, that the bigger groups of consumers uh, seem to like were uh, somewhat defective and um, not bitter and not pungent and not stringent. So with this, let me say something about what the experts say would be high quality olive oil versus what the consumers like. So if we take the same set of oils and then we ask a group of experts, which we did at the uh, International Los Angeles uh, Olive Oil Competition, what we found is that the experts were very much in agreement. They are shown on the right side of the slide and they all point to the same direction to the far right next to oils five, two and seven. And if you see the, the left side of the, the graph is the, the one I just showed you a minute ago, which shows that the consumers like exactly the opposite. So if we were to correlate uh, quality judged by experts to liking by consumers, it's a, a downward straight line. It's a perfect regression. And I have to, uh, to do a little shout out for oil seven, two, and five, which happen to be uh, Villa Campestri, Castillo de Canena, Rosa Vaño's oil, who is not, not here today, and then McEvoy Ranch uh, from California. Those were the top oils as far as their quality judged by experts, and yet they were not the most popular with consumers. So we have some work to do here. So talking about our Villa Campestre, everything started in the late 80s. Um, we are set 35 kilometers north of Florence. And the big question was to answer, um, can be olive oil uh, be a travel destination? 
So um, due to in the increased interest in consumers in this novel fat, we ask ourselves, why don't we transform Villa Campestri into an olive oil resort? And actually, that's what we did. And uh, uh, we created the first uh, Olioteca for a complete olive oil tasting experience from the setting to the restaurant to olive oil massages and everything is, you know, um, actually is built around olive oil. So talking about the setting, the villa, as you can see, that is Villa Campestri, and those are the olive groves, uh, uh, is immersed in, in an olive grove. Um, the, the, the property is really big, uh, um, but in addition to the uh, typical cultivars of the olive trees that we usually find in Tuscany, we also experimented uh, varieties typical of the southern part of Italy, uh, especially varieties from Campania. Uh, Itrana and Ravece are the two varieties that mm, we wanted to test. And the question we wanted to ask, to answer was, um, is the typical descriptors, the sensory descriptors of the cultivars maintained with the changing of the area of cultivation? And the answer is no. So they are not uh, maintained. Um, it's very well known in the southern part of Italy. Um, these cultivars that I mentioned are um, developing typical sensory notes of tomato. Um, tomato leaves, they're very prominent. But in the inland Tuscany, so where we are, actually, um, those sensory notes are no longer there. So therefore, we can summarize as uh, French people say uh, that the terroir plays an essential role in uh, developing uh, uh, these, uh, these notes. So going to the next slide, sorry. Um, well, I have um, experience in uh, consumer education uh, in olive oil, and we actually um, put education in quotes because mm, what we do, it's not a real education. Um, it's more a proposal to experience uh, um, highly defective olive oil and uh, highly extraordinary one. Can I say that? You tasted. <laughs> so I, I think you liked it. So. Well, the very highly defective olive oil I usually buy at the supermarket. It's very easy to find. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, the very good one I usually produce in our own meal. So <laughs> that is not that easy, but we manage to do it. So the gap, the distance between the, the two samples make the education. And people realize it right away. It's just a matter of showing you know, to olive oil without even saying anything. They, they just get it. So as Maria was saying earlier, I think that education in olive oil is extremely necessary um, from the very early stage, uh, from, you know, um, elementary school. Uh, because you realize that guests admit that the only reason why they buy a specific bottle of olive oil is because it fits in their fridge. And when you tell them that actually olive oil is not supposed to be kept in the fridge, they, they stare at you. So uh, there's a lot of preconception uh, in the world of olive oil. So we need to realize that and then move forward. So at our restaurant, uh, L'Olivaia, uh, we let guests play with a trio sampler, which is in the picture of olive oil with three different sensory profile and food, and people just love it, you know, to play with a different sensory profile and food. And the same enthusiasm that is created ar around the conversation with wine is absolutely true. Somebody was saying that, Joseph, maybe, or Rafi, I can't remember, but somebody was saying that you know, you can create uh, enthusiasm also around the taste of different olive oils. Because olive oil, what we are actually showing is a lifestyle, is sustainability, is biodiversity, 
And uh, what we offer is not only extra virgin olive oil tasting, but also cooking and eating with olive oil. And here again, lots of preconception. People ask, is it safe to cook and fry with olive oil? And at that time, I stare at them, because if you think about the culture, you know, that we have created out of millennia of people living and cooking and frying with olive oil, well, <laughs> the answer is no. It's not dangerous to cook with olive oil. It's not dangerous to fry with it. So how it can be dangerous? So, well, we use olive oil on everything in our family. And uh, what you tasted before, it's uh, a memory that I have of my dad. So do you remember you taste the cookie, the uh, ricciarelli? OK, so these are typical of Siena, but also typical of Florence. And they happen to be made during the period of extraction. So it's uh, October and November. So what my dad used to do was buying fresh ricciarelli, the one that you tasted are a little bit more uh, dry, because of course uh, um, they are not uh, uh, in the period of production, although I managed to find them. And uh, he would make a hole with a finger <laughs> in the middle, and then pass the biscuit um, directly from the, from the centrifuge and uh, with fresh olive oil flowing. And so you realize how good that was. So showing people these is showing people a lifestyle. And people just love it, just need it. So we are in the hub of olive oil production. Just, just use it. All right. So what I, what I want to do next is to talk about some, uh, some research we've, we've actually done together with, uh, with the CIA and with Villa Campesti. And it's part of our uh, so-called flip strategy where we're exploring replacing not so healthy ingredients with healthy ones that happen to bring flavor boosting properties to the, to the dish. The proof of concept research was done um, with the protein flip replacing uh, beef with, uh, with mushrooms and, and leading to the development of the blend uh, with the CIA. In this case, what we did was to look at replacing butter uh, with olive oil in a range of uh, iconic dishes. And we did this uh, cross-culturally, where we collected data in California, but also in Italy and in Spain. So the, um, the design was as follow, and we call this the fat flip. Um, and we're picturing Chef Bill Briwa, uh, who passed away, but from the CIA, who, who was our main collaborator on this study. Um, and we, we developed uh, four dishes, fish with parsley, lemon, and capers, spaghetti with cheese, green beans, and then ciambellone cake. And the idea, the idea there was then to uh, make those with two different types of butters, uh, imported and domestic, and then four different kinds of olive oils representing the different styles that you might find out there, from, uh, from mild and buttery to uh, robust and bitter and pungent, and then all the way to defective, rancid, and custy. And we had um, between 125 and 135 consumers, each in California, Italy, and Spain, uh, evaluate the, uh, the dishes for liking uh, and a set of holistic measures um, as well. So here's a picture of the setting in California, the Sensory Theater at the Mondavi Institute. Uh, this is in Prato, Italy, next to Florence. And then this is in Madrid, Spain, uh, with uh, Consumo Lab. So what did we find? Well, I have literally tens and tens of slides to, that I could show you, but I, I'll just speak a couple of examples. If we look at the average liking uh, for each of these six uh, formulations, on the left, uh, red and blue are the, uh, the butter formulations, and then the other four are the four different types of olive oil. If we look at something like green beans, California is on the left, Spain in the middle, and Italy on the right. We can see that uh, for Californians, butter was better. Uh, for Spaniards, it was uh, a fairly even match. And then for the Italians, they preferred their uh, green beans with olive oil. The, the next thing that I want to show you is what happens with pasta. And um, clearly, butter wins in, in, uh, in California on the left and in, even in Spain on the, uh, in the middle. 
And then for the Italians, it's, it's more evenly split. But still, butter does very well, uh, as well as the defective olive oil on, uh, on the right in yellow. But as I mentioned before, whenever we do consumer research, we look at segmentation. So in addition to looking at average liking, we want to see how many groups of people like different types of, um, of, uh, of dishes. If we run this kind of analysis, for example, for the pasta dish in Italy, uh, what we find is that we have four different preference segments, as you can see with the diversity of points on the left. And on the right, we show the preferences for the, the six formulations for each of these preference segments. What you can see on the, on the left is that we have a preference segments that likes the robust uh, green fruity olive oil, and that's very uh, nice news. But then on the far right, we have um, consumers who like just about everything the same. And then the second one from the left are actually consumers who prefer butter. But if we lump all of these together, we find a majority of consumers who would like um, an olive oil-based formulation for their pasta. But the grand average, butter will, uh, will win. So butter wins overall, the key finding. But our overall preference patterns varied by consumer group and by dish. And there was preference segmentation among Spanish and Italian consumers that showed some segments would prefer uh, to go with olive oil. So it, it's all very good news. So uh, Paolo, my father, explored deeply um, the design uh, of olive oil. And of course, design uh, is not only rele relevant to equipment, uh, design, which is of course increased the liking, but it's also to designing uh, an olive oil experience. So design increased the surprise, increased the joy, increased the curiosity, um, the positive emotions, and uh, therefore um, a transformative process that disrupts completely automatic creation driven by, again, preconception. So um, one of the recurring questions during uh, our olive oil tasting session were how to store the olive oil. So all this led uh, Paolo to develop a dispenser where the three enemies of olive oil, light, temperature, and oxygen were under control. And this is olive solid, uh, is the picture on the left. Um, and since uh, we consider that olive oil is a journey and the first thing that you do when you, when you leave for a trip is to take uh, a very nice book to read during your holiday, well, when you leave from an olive oil resort, what you take with you is, uh, um, is a library of life. So it's a, it's a box, actually. I have a, I have a picture, but I also have a, a, a sample here. Uh, so it's a box where actually inside there's uh, the three cans that you have seen and uh, with three different uh, sensory profiles and each can is designed with a label reproducing the spine cover um, of a book of three different volumes. So just to give you some ideas, just some, to give you some example on uh, how uh, it's important and uh, it's essential increase not only the excellence of the product, which is absolutely necessary, but also we need to increase the engagement around the olive oil world. And thanks to strategic partnership like the Culinary Institute of America, UC Davis, um, Castillo de Canena, Academia dei Giorgofili, we uh, all have in common a goal, which is to discover um, the tr true value of olive oil, of course, increase the excellence and increase the engagement. So the, the next, the next item that uh, that we want to we want to address is the need for and the power of communication and education. Um, we we've already heard about some of those strategies today. All of these uh, extremely valuable. But we need to advocate for the virtues and the diversity of olive oil. And by that, we mean sensory, culinary, and health uh, matters. 
And we can do this to specialized audience, as, as has been done with, uh, with the Food Values Conference, with the Beyond Extroverting Conferences, and so on. But we feel that um, two groups that have very key roles to play in this advocacy and promotion are the chefs, uh, as was stressed earlier uh, and, and shown how you can do it very successfully by, by Greg, and then Gen Zs, the, the younger generations, which have become, uh, especially post-pandemic, very engaged with, uh, with, with healthy, sustainable, and delicious uh, food and drink, and then the general public. How do we do this? Well, um, it begins with exposure. Uh, exposure drives liking, so maximizing exposure and knowledge to drive liking, purchase, and repeat purchase. You know, you need to try it once, and then you want to try, try it again. And consumption through proper marketing, uh, the use of social media, which the Gen Zs, Gen Zs are going to help us uh, do very effectively, labeling, workshops and classes, and then experiences. You know, I think whether you come into Villa Campestri or going to a restaurant or uh, participating in a tasting or, or just taking a chance on a new olive oil at, at your supermarket, once you've had the experience, uh, things are going to change because you're going to become aware of that diversity, which uh, still too few people are, are aware of. So very important um, need to communicate and to, and to educate. Well, um, I need to close the, <laughs> I need to close these um, parts. And um, well, there, there's so many teaching that my father left uh, over, but um, one of one of one of the best, I would say, is to do not accept the obvious. So whatever is obvious, it can be as it is. So do not accept what it is. And I think you can apply this to the word of olive oil because what people are actually accepting is the obvious, is what you buy in the supermarket, and this is not the case. So not accepting the obvious means finding possible solution and therefore start thinking. He, he kept saying, the day you give up thinking, you give up everything. So let's try to go beyond the product. Let's try to embrace the, uh, an experience, because olive oil is an experience. So those are my son and my niece, one of my niece, when they were kids, now they're grown up, uh, playing with the olive oil. Well, that is also part of the experience. And one of the reasons why we are doing all this is to give root to the next generation. So thank you very much. <laughs>